Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 131, in which I will do a thorough debrief of the first exam for the fall 2017 semester. What is the purpose of this video? The purpose of this video is to go through each exam question and provide two different pieces of information. The first, I'm going to go through the solutions in more detail than the rubric provides. And second, I want to provide a sense of which in-class activities were important for helping you be successful on a particular question. Pay particular attention to this aspect of this video as it will help you focus during class in preparation for the next exam. If, for a particular exam question, you do not see the connection between the question and the in-class activities, please make an appointment to come see me as soon as possible because you are likely missing something fundamental about the discipline of physics. Let's begin by going through the multiple choice section. The first multiple choice question involved converting the density of mercury from grams per cubic centimeter to milligrams per cubic micrometer. So we knew that the density of mercury was 13.5 grams per centimeter cubed. We know that there are 1,000 milligrams per gram. So my units of gram cancels. And then I know that in any given centimeter, there are 10 to the minus 4 micrometers. However, this conversion only gets rid of one power of centimeters. I'm going to need two more. When you put that into your calculator, you'll get choice D. The information for this particular problem was from the unit conversions that we did in class and the math we expect you to know document, which included the SI prefixes from nano to giga. In particular, unit 1, slide 10 through 14 of the third day were particularly applicable to this particular problem. In fact, slide 14 had a problem that was exceedingly similar to this problem in that it was a conversion of density as well. The second multiple choice question involved the force lab and trying to determine which block had the higher mass. The correct answer was the gray graph. Both the expressions for friction, both the static and kinetic friction expressions that we discussed in class, depend upon the normal force. In the friction lab that you did in class, the normal force was, in this particular case, equal to mg because there was no acceleration of the box in the y direction. Therefore, more friction implies that a higher normal force, which implies that you had more mass. The gray curve clearly has higher friction throughout and therefore more mass. The class exercise that was relevant for this particular question was the friction lab that we did. Moving on to the third multiple choice question, where we had a graph which showed the position as it traveled along the x-axis. The question was, during which times is the acceleration in the negative direction? The correct answer was E, and this could be discovered by trying to sketch out the acceleration graph. In order to do this, you first have to sketch out the velocity as a function of time. Picking a few points, we can see that here at t equals zero, the velocity is large and positive. At some point later, say two, the velocity is still positive, but rather small. At three seconds, the velocity is in fact zero. And then at four seconds, the velocity is negative and somewhat small. Connecting the dots that we have just drawn, we get a velocity that is eternally decreasing, which when we go to sketch the acceleration as a function of time, we get a constant line, which is negative. However, a student made a very good case that the first part of this particular graph 
does look somewhat linear. And as such, I'm going to give 50% credit for choice D. The motion lab, as well as the sixth day of unit one, in particular slide eight, which was essentially the same problem, should have prepared you for this particular question. Now let's move on to the fourth multiple choice question, wherein you are pushing a box across a floor at constant speed, and you're asked which of the following are true. The fact that you are pushing the box with a force larger than the force of friction, or you must be pushing on the box harder than the box is pushing back on you, or finally, there must be a force of friction between the floor and the box. The correct answer was C, that only three was true. To see this, we begin with Newton's second law that the sum of the forces must be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Because it is constant velocity, there is zero acceleration in the x direction. And therefore, there must be a force opposing the push. Drawing a free body diagram for the box, we see that, of course, we have the normal from the ground on the box and the weight from the earth on the box, and clearly the push from the person, in order to get constant velocity and zero force, there must be a force of friction. So statement one cannot be true, because if the push were larger than the friction, then the box would not travel at constant speed, but would in fact accelerate. Statement two, on the other hand, is manifestly false by Newton's third law. Unit two, day one, slides one through four are essentially the same type of problem. Now let's move on to the fifth multiple choice question, wherein a 45 kilogram person steps on a scale in an elevator, and the scale reads a steady 410 newtons. The correct answer was C, that the elevator is moving upwards and slowing down. This can be seen by thinking about where the forces acting on the person, so we have the normal up from the scale on the person and the force of weight down from the earth on the person. Looking at Newton's second law, in particular we can see that the y direction is going to be the relevant direction. There's not much going on in the x direction. The forces acting are we have the normal force up and we have the weight force down, and this must be equal to MAY. We know that the weight force is going to be MG, because weight forces have a formula. We know the normal force, it's given as 410 newtons. We know 45 kilos and we know 9.8. Putting this into our calculator, we see 410 minus 441, which means that Ay must be negative, because mass is certainly going to be positive, which means we need an acceleration down. And the only choice that has an acceleration downwards is choice C. This elevator problem and ones very similar to it were discussed in unit two, day five, slides four through seven, unit two, day six, slides one through three, with the results in particular summarized on slide three of unit two, day six. The six multiple choice question involved bullets fired from a tree at various heights with various horizontal speeds. The correct answer was E, that none of the other choices are correct. From the simulation lab, you should know that the x and y directions are independent. And from your simulation lab, you achieve the time of flight from solely looking at the y direction. The only relevant quantity was the vertical height, not the horizontal speed. Therefore, B and C, since they are fired from the same height, will hit the ground at the same time and shooter A's bullet will hit the ground first. Even though it is shot with the highest speed, it's shot from the lowest height and will therefore hit the ground first. 
multiple choice seven involved a car pushing a truck. And the correct answer was that the amount of force with which the car pushes on the truck is equal to that which the truck pushes backwards on the car. And this was a manifest application of Newton's third law, which says that the normal force from car on truck must be equal to the normal force from truck on car in magnitude, with the directions being opposite. The car is pushing forwards and the truck is pushing backwards. Problems very similar to this particular problem were done in Unit 2, Day 4, slides 7 through 15, Unit 2, Day 5, on the first slide as you were coming in, and then Unit 2, Day 6, slides 8 through 11. Multiple choice problem number 8 involved a box sitting on a table, and you were looking to find the magnitude of the normal force of the table on the box. So, as usual, we begin with Newton's second law, that the sum of the forces must be the mass times the acceleration. Looking at the components, we can see that really only the y direction is going to be particularly relevant in this situation. Not a whole lot going on in x that we're going to need. So we'll start with the y direction. We see that the acceleration in y is going to be zero because nothing is moving in the y direction. Now to identify what forces are acting in y, we have our two tensions, we have the weight, and we have a normal force from the table on the box. Putting these forces into our sum, we see we have force normal, table on box, we have, if we call this T1 and T2, we have a Y component of T1, we have a Y component of T2, and we have a weight force from the earth on the box down. The weight force has a formula, as always, so we can go and replace that with just mg. Now for our tension forces, we need to identify which is the y component. Now the two tensions are very, very similar. So once I figure out one, I'll have both. So there is my tension. There is my 30 degrees. That's the y component. And that is the x component. And we see that the cosine of 30 degrees is the y component over the tension. So substituting that in, we have the force normal 2, because the two ropes are essentially the same, and so then we get a normal force which is not mg, but is in fact mg minus 2t cosine 30 degrees, which is choice A. I'm going to give 50% credit for choice B, as the only mistake you made is you have the wrong trig function. This was discussed in Unit 2, Day 3, slides 5 through 14. The concept of the normal force not being equal to mg was emphasized throughout Unit 2, in particular in the elevator problems that we've already discussed, and also Unit 2, Day 6, slides 13 through 16 were somewhat similar to this problem in that you had a rope and a normal force and you were solving. Multiple choice number 9 involved trying to pick the graph from the story given. The correct answer was B. I am going to give 50% credit for choice D as the only real mistake that you made is the slope being incorrect in this particular region. This was really discussed in Unit 1, Day 4, Slides 20 through 24, and in your motion lab. We also had some discussion of this in Unit 1, Day 6, Slides 5 through 6. Multiple choice question number 10 involve a girl attaching a rock to a string, swinging it over her head in a counterclockwise direction when the string breaks. And you're looking to see the direction of the rock. The correct answer for the path of the rock is choice B. 
This is essentially a question in object egoism. After release, there are no more horizontal forces in what we might call the x and y directions. There might, there's one in and out of the page, but that's not important due to independence of directions. So after release, there are no horizontal forces in x or y. Therefore, motion in the x or y plane no longer changes. There is no force, there is no change in the motion. And therefore, the rock travels in a straight line from this view. The in-class activities that would have helped you with this particular problem are Unit 1, Day 6, slides 11 through 14, and then Unit 2, Day 3, slide 1 was very, very similar to the same problem. To summarize the breakdown of the multiple choice portion of your exam, we see that questions 1, 3, 9, and 10, or 40% of your exam, came from Unit 1. Questions 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, 60% of your exam came from Unit 2. There was at least one question from each lab, in and the motion lab in particular helped with a few different questions, and there was at least one question from each day of class. Now let's move on to the long answer portion of the exam. The first long answer question asked you to give an example of a situation where the velocity and the acceleration are in opposite directions. There were many, many, many acceptable answers to this. One example is a ball thrown upwards. On the way up, the ball is moving upwards and the acceleration, due to the force of gravity, is downwards. Any correct answer receives full credit. We practiced with this idea on Unit 1, Day 4, Slides 9 through 16, and was incorporated as well into the various elevator problems where you had to work out the sign of the acceleration from a description of the motion. This brings us to long answer number two, where you are looking to solve for the magnitude of the force with which the person is pushing in terms of m, g, and the coefficient of friction, uk. And we're required to draw a free body diagram for each block. Let's begin by drawing a free body diagram for each block. For block M, the smaller one, we have the freebie, the force of weight from the earth on M, and the normal force from the ground on M. We have the normal force from 3M on M, not the person, because the person is not touching M. And we have the force of friction from the ground on M. And this is going to be kinetic friction because the block is sliding. Moving on to block 3M, we can see, okay, we have the, the freebies, the weight from the earth on 3M. We have the normal force from the ground on 3m. We have the normal force from the person on 3m, which is ultimately what we're going to be looking for. We're going to have the force of kinetic friction from the ground on 3m, and we are going to have a normal force from m on 3m, where these two forces must exist because of a Newton's third law pair. If 3m pushes on m, m pushes on 3m. Now we can begin to actually solve the problem by looking at Newton's second law. So we can begin looking at Newton's second law. I am going to begin actually by looking at the sum of the forces on m itself, not 3m. I'm going to start with m. The vector symbol tells me to think in terms of the x and y directions separately. And then I'm going to pick a direction to work with. I am going to begin by thinking in terms of the y direction. So the sum of the forces in y is may. The acceleration in y is equal to zero because no motion in that direction. 
So that means I have the sum of the forces in Y must be zero. Looking at my diagram, I have a normal force up and a weight force down. The normal force doesn't have a formula, so there's not much I can do with it. But the weight force does have a formula, mg, so I can put that in. And so we see that for this particular problem, the normal force is, again, equal to mg for this particular situation. Then I can move on to thinking in terms of the x direction on m. Ax is going to be 0 because velocity is constant. So that leaves me with the sum of the forces in x must be 0. Looking at my diagram, I have a normal force from 3m on m to the right and a frictional force from the ground on 3m to the left. Normal forces don't have formulas, so there's not much I can do about it. But my frictional force does have a formula, mu normal. The normal force comes from the y direction that we have already solved. So I can put that in. And so now I know the normal force with which 3m pushes on m, which is going to be important because I can see looking ahead, I am going to need it when I deal with the block 3m, which I'll do now. So now let's deal with the block 3m. So we can see that the sum of the forces on block 3m is going to be equal to the acceleration. As usual, the vector symbol says that I should think about splitting my expression into x and y components. And then I'm going to pick one to deal with. I'm going to do y because it looks a little bit simpler. The acceleration in y is 0, again, because no motion in that direction. So I have the sum of the forces in y must be 0. Looking at my diagram, what forces do I have in y? I have a normal force from the ground up. And I have a weight force from the earth down. Normal forces don't have formulas, so there's not much I can do about it. Weight forces definitely do. So now I get the normal force from the ground on 3m. Then I move to the x direction. In this case, the acceleration is again 0 because constant velocity. So the sum of the forces in x must be 0. Looking at my diagram, I have the normal force from the per person to the right. I have a force of kinetic friction from the ground to the left. And I have the normal force from m on 3m also to the left. This normal force is what I'm looking for, so I shouldn't do anything with that. Frictional forces have formulas. And this normal force, we actually already know from having looked at block m. So we can see that the normal force from m on 3m is going to be mu k m g. Now all I need is the normal force here that comes up in the friction expression, which I can get from what I have done in the y direction, which I can get from what I have done in the y direction. So again, the normal force from 
m on 3m comes from looking at 3m on m in the x direction. And the normal force in the friction expression comes from looking at the y direction on 3m. So putting it all together, we get uk, that's 3mg, minus uk mg. And so we get a normal force from the person on 3m of 4 uk mg. This was a very cumulative problem that incorporated many aspects of what we had talked about in Unit 2. Particular problems that would have been helpful in being successful in this exam question would have involved the problem solving with Newton's second law on Unit 2, Day 3, the free body diagrams for Newton's third on Unit 2, Day 4, slides 12 through 14, and the blocks tied together problem on slides 17 through 20 of that day was very, very, very similar to this particular problem. The Einstein in the elevator is basically a vertical version of this problem on unit two, day five, slides four through seven, because instead of two blocks pushing against each other, you're looking at a scale and Einstein pushing on each other. And finally, problems on slides 16 through 25 of unit two, day six would have been very helpful. This concludes this video.